So we are very fortunate uh, to have with us Professor Adam Tooze, who holds uh, the Shelby Callum Davis Chair of History at Columbia University and serves as director of, U of the European Institute there. His latest book is uh, Crashed, How a Decade of Financial Crisis Changed the World, uh, a book that I strongly recommend. And he's currently working on, on an history of the climate crisis. Uh, and I think that we'll touch uh, on this topic among others uh, during uh, our conversation. So Adam, welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. So my first question uh, concerns uh, an article for The Guardian on May 7th, uh, where you wrote that we are living through the first economic crisis of the, of the Anthropocene, uh, which is the ge geological era when the human impact on the ecosystem is significant, or as you put it in the article, the era in which the impact on nature has begun to blow back on us in an unpredictable and disastrous way. Why do you consider uh, this as the first crisis of the Anthropocene era, and what makes it so different from other crises? Well, I mean, I think obviously we're, we're navigating here in terrain, which is, you know, being mapped as we speak um, by scientific research on the genesis of zoonotic diseases. We think COVID is the product of zoonosis. Um, the diagnosis of the risks to human society of new emerging infectious diseases emerges in the 70s, 1970s and 1980s, so 50 years ago, at the same time really as the emergence of the modern global environmental movement, at the same time as the emergence of climate science, at the same time really of the dawning awareness of what we now call the Anthropocene. So I think it's fair to describe this as one of the obvious sort of risks of that epoch. In other words, if we engage in the kind of massive enrollment of the wild environment, if we engage in the kind of massive animal husbandry that we engage in, we should expect this kind of shock. Um, and there is a track record, and the Royal Society in London, for instance, has done work on this, of an increasing tendency for these kind of risks to emerge in the disease environment. We're beginning to map how large that risk potential is. Um, and it seems indeed that there is every reason to expect an accelerating series of shocks like this. And when you look against the backdrop of the, you know, first swine fever panic in 76, followed by, you know, the escalating series of crises, including, of course, the HIV epidemic, uh, but then also the swine flu uh, panic, the SARS, MERS, avian flu, which is really the nightmare which never actually has emerged, then we, I think we have to regard COVID as, as one of a series of shocks, uh, which we should expect more of. And it is, of course, by no means the worst type of shock that we might experience in this category. Um, so that's why I kind of regard this as a shock of the Anthropocene epoch. Um, and uh, why is it the first comprehensive crisis? Well, I think all we have to do is look around us. Um, you know, it's clear that the Anthropocene has so far generated um, crises of a local variety in many places, in the most vulnerable places on Earth. It's, it's a fallacy, for instance, to imagine that climate change is only going to affect us on Greater Thunberg's kind of timeline. I mean, there are parts of the world which are already very immediately impacted. Um, but none of them so far have had the capacity of those shocks so far have had the capacity to generate a truly systemic impact. And what's so remarkable about the COVID shock, and I don't just mean the governmental reaction, but the collective reaction of economic actors around the world, households, families, businesses, is that it is produced as the IMF and the World Bank have documented, the single largest and most comprehensive shock the world economy has ever suffered. Like so 90% plus of the economies around the world have suffered a recession early in 2020. And this is unprecedented in economic history. So it's anthropocenic. It's comprehensive. It's dramatic in its scope. Um, there have been other major economic crises, of course, but, but none have quite the same sweep and none have this genesis. Um, 
and none have this profile. I, the, the, you know, you're, you're an economist, I don't need to tell you, but like this is a very unusual business cycle shock. This is not the way that business cycles normally propagate um, because it's coming out of the service sector. It's simultaneously a demand and supply shock. It's not principally being driven by a collapse in investment, for instance. Um, but once it gets going, of course, it has dynamics, which we don't really, we don't really have a map for. Um, and it could easily begin to intersect with other sorts of issues that we know are troubling the world economy, secular stagnation as a potential diagnosis, the reversing of globalization. Anyway, so that is why, to give rather a long answer, this is why it seems to me to legitimate to think of this as the first great crisis of the Anthropocene. And, it, and I do think we have to think of it as a harbinger of other shocks to come. I mean, just before this crisis hit, the global financial community, led, led by central banks, notably in Europe, were beginning to wrap their heads around the idea of, say, a climate Minsky moment. This was Mark Carney's agenda at the Bank of England. Um, the idea that you could have a rippling shock that would come out of the fossil fuel economy as a result of a climate disaster followed by a kind of Angela Merkel style abrupt change in position, say, on like her shift in 2011 on nuclear power, that could devalue a huge class of assets and that would then unleash a Minsky style financial crisis. The, 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 you know, the leaders of the global central banking community were beginning to imagine that scenario, uh, really spell it out, model it. And hey, presto, it's come along in the form of the COVID crisis much sooner than I think anyone anticipated. And we've managed, you know, it hasn't been in the end, the wheels have not come off the bus. We, we, it doesn't look as though we're tumbling towards a Great Depression style crisis, but it, it will remain one of the most severe um, and savage shocks that uh, the world economy has suffered, including Europe. Yes, so um, to follow up on the economic side, uh, so the title of this conversation, uh, Will the Normal Economy Ever Come Back, is based on a short article you wrote in April on foreign policy, whose title was The Normal Economy is Never Coming Back. Therefore, I have already your answer to the question. Still, I would like to expand it further. Uh, at the end of that article, uh, you wrote, and I quote, in the response by businesses and households, uh, if the response by businesses and households is a risk aversion and a flight to safety, it will compound the forces of stagnation. If the public response to the debts and accumulated uh, by the crisis is austerity, that will make matters worse. It makes sense uh, uh, to call instead for a more active, more visionary government to lead the way out of the crisis. But the question, of course, is what form, and will, what form that will take and which political forces will control it, end of quote. In, in light of what has happened since April, how do you see the way forward? So far, have governments and central banks been sufficiently active and visionary in their actions? Um, yeah, you, you must allow a little bit of uh, editorial license here. One doesn't, one doesn't get to pick one's article headings. Uh, I, I might not have titled the piece the way that foreign policy did. Um, but you gave a, you know, you gave a fair and lengthy quote. So, um, uh, the radicalism of that, of, that, of that title, I think, you know, refers back to the your first question, in other words, do I think we've entered a new epoch? I think the answer is emphatically yes. Should we expect these kind of shocks? I think the answer is clearly we should. Um, under those circumstances, what impact would one expect that to have on the private sector? It's very hard, I think, to avoid the conclusion that it massively raises the bar or lowers the bar for our awareness of the radical uncertainty that surrounds us. If that is true, would you expect it to re in, uh, induce, if you like, a variety of different precautionary behaviours? I think you clearly would. And you would expect to see this both in the private sector, in households and in, and in, in business. If, if, if that is the case, then we should expect this to amplify the te tendencies towards secular stagnation that people like Larry Summers were talking about really since 2013. And then I think we're led inevitably to the kind of Keynesian conclusion, which is that in the vacuum left by that kind of private sector caution, uh, where is dynamic, forward-looking investment um, going to come from? And, and it's difficult to avoid that it has uh, avoid the conclusion it has to come from the public sector. So that's as a preliminary. What have how have governments done? 
Um, well, I think um, maybe it's worth saying, you know, looking at four groups. Um, let me start with the one that you might not be expecting to start with, which is, as it were, emerging markets, governments. My sense is that this crisis reinforces the lesson that we already got from 2008, which is that the G20 or the G30 are now a force to be reckoned with in the world economy. In other words, there are many state actors around the world which are capable of mounting highly competent, large-scale, macroeconomically significant responses to a crisis like this. And they range from South Korea to Indonesia to Turkey to South Africa. And of course, there, you know, we will grade them on a scale and some will end up looking better than others. But that is the world that we're in, right? We have to think of the world economy today as radically multipolar. Um, it's not enough just to look at the big three. This is a huge problem also for the future of diplomacy of climate change, for instance, where the G30 or the G20 at least matter a great deal. Um, and we have seen some fairly remarkable performances by countries that would fit in that G30 group in response to COVID. Um, are they you know, mapping out long distance futures? Not in all cases, but a country like South Korea is. Um, this was also a characteristic of their response to 0809. And one has to say they have emerged as what is surely an exemplary case of democratic capitalist governance in response to this crisis. Um, what we've seen on the ch on, in China is, um, you know, a kind of shifting picture. I mean, I think the, the first impression in March in, well, the crisis, of course, starts in China already in February. February through April, I think, one would have to say that the Chinese response was muted. There was a sense in which they were just trying to get a grip on the COD situation. I think what we've seen since May is with escalating clarity since the three meetings, you know, the, 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 sorry, the, 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 the two, the two um, meetings of their, you know, the political leadership is a reassertion of rather an aggressive agenda for Chinese national development, which also has an economic component. Um, they are going to double down on national technological and industrial policy. Um, the repression in Hong Kong is matched by plans on a huge scale for the development of the Greater Bay Area region, which is an area the size of a European state, which will be equipped with massive new infrastructure. There are large Chinese plans for next generation technology. Um, it will be interesting, I think, to see how One Belt, One Road develops under the impact of this crisis. I think the dust is you know, still settling on that story. So I think in the Chinese case, we have seen the push. The surprise is, is the EU. I mean, um, I, will, I will honestly admit that I am, I've been surprised by the way the European story went, because in March, April, it looked as though it was heading in exactly the direction, the dismal, predictable direction that one would expect, the failure to coordinate, um, north-south divides, victimization of the weakest, notably the Italians. Um, and we know that that is not the direction that things have developed in. Um, the ECB has, I think, further progressed in its development towards being a more conventional central bank. Um, and I've you know, been vociferous in arguing for the need for this to be reflected in a new mandate for the ECB that actually reflects what it does rather than having to constantly shoehorn things into its extraordinarily restricted legal mandate. That's probably pie in the sky, but that gives you a sense of where I would want this to go. Corona bonds was a dead end politically, but Merkel and Macron have found an alternative which pushes in the same direction. Um, we all know, and I don't need to tell you, and you're much more into this than I am, that the, the deal is not yet done. The fat lady hasn't sung. We are not out of the woods. We do not know where this is headed. And furthermore, this is not a Hamiltonian moment because it doesn't deal with legacy debt. I mean, the striking thing about the European situation is that German Berlin took the chance to redefine the situation by saying this is a new crisis, which therefore enables a new type of response. We don't have moral hazard issues. This is a natural event. And so therefore we can rethink the politics of all of this. But the problem with that approach, though it opens a door and that is very welcome, is that it perforce excludes dealing with the legacy issues. And it's just not obvious to me, given the modest scale of the jointly funded issues, that that's going to be sufficient to cope with the Italian problem. I mean, after all, we're going to be in a situation by next year with Italian debt to GDP over 150% of GDP. 
we can talk in a minute perhaps about what the implications of that are. But I think you'd have to say that in the European case, something like an organizing vision has emerged. America is the real question mark here. And it's not obvious to me. I mean, you know, this would require a whole different conversation, really. But I mean, we're all aware we've all been living in it. Those of us who have the misfortune to actually be in the United States right now, the the disastrous uh, display of incoherence. And this, too, is, in a sense, a kind of interesting narrative development, because in March and April, you would say at that moment, it seemed like the classic nation states were demonstrating that they had a certain advantage in facing this crisis. And by this, I would also include the UK, in that what they were able to quite rapidly do is coordinate fiscal and monetary policy and do so in a very unproblematic way, up to and including direct monetary financing in the UK case, which the Bank of England just said, let's screw it. We don't need to go to the gilts market. Let's just run this through an overdraft facility. That's obviously you know, an easy and smart thing to do given the sort of chaos we were seeing in gilt markets on March 18th. Like you do not want putting a lot of pressure on that market at that moment. So, you know, what what we have seen in both, and the, effectively, de facto, the Fed was doing something for the US, similar for the US Treasury, though they won't admit that it's straight monetary financing, it amounts to the same thing. Um, what we have seen coming to the fore more and more since late April and May are the underlying basic strategic issues facing both those national polities you know, the, we, you know, the polarization of their politics, the terrible nightmare of Brexit in the British case, the explosion of the, you know, political dissent in the United States, um, which means at this stage, um, the longer term prospects, I think, um, are, are alarming in the American case. Um, and to compound it, you know, if there's one thing that the American political class appears to be able to agree on, it is that the longer term future involves a confrontation with China. So, you know, if there's any piece of the strategic puzzle which is relatively clear, it is that there is bipartisan support for something that 12 months ago even would have seemed, I think, almost out of the box, which is decoupling. Um, but I think that is now being pushed with a, a very high degree of seriousness on both sides um, and the pursuit of Huawei, the militarization, if you like, of the discourse on the American side um, is going to make it very difficult for um, the Americans, the Democrats, any more than the Republicans to walk back from this. And that as a strategic horizon is, is, is shocking for a whole series of American corporates, be it Apple, be it GM, be it the chip makers, they didn't have this as part of their business model. Um, so, you know, one could imagine a future, of course, in which you then have a national industrial policy and you mobilize billions and billions for an American chip industry and Apple reconfigures its supply chain to base it around whatever, Vietnam. Um, one could imagine that future, um, but um, it's a huge shock. So, um, I think on, from that side, um, and as a historian, somebody who's worked on the 20th century, watching the American political establishment right now as it spirals into an increasingly, I mean, it's, 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 it's literally and intellectually a focus on the ideology of the CCP. I mean, the fact that the leading figures of the American national security establishment have discovered the fact that she appears to be some kind of 21st century Marxist who actually will give speeches in which he insists on the continuity of his party's tradition with that of Stalin, which is, of course has always been true, but it's, it's suddenly come to the attention of the American security establishment and is being mobilized as an argument. This changes the game um, because it's not, it's, it's from there, you then need to go through an entire process of detente, as it were, to re-neutralize this problem. Uh, and it's very unclear whether Biden and the people around Biden have any interest in doing that. So, so this is a this is a really dizzying transformation in our in our prospects. And it's very interesting to see Angela Merkel right now and the EU and the EU's foreign you know foreign affairs establishment walking the line on this in the way that they are, um, because the stakes are in a sense even higher, especially when we think of the broader agenda, notably climate change. Um, where players like VW, for instance, who are key to Europe's industrial policy on climate change, 
have a huge stake in China. I mean, for them, they can't, un- you know, EV e-mobility for VW is a joint German-Chinese project, or it isn't a project at all. Um, and, um, you know, so there are very huge issues at stake here. 5G is part of it. As if we all know about that story, but I think there are a whole variety of other issues being played out. Adam, to follow up to um, your answer, um, I mean, the, the, uh, it has been claimed that uh, um, the reaction that was taken at national level uh, the, and in the case of Europe, at European level, was also the uh, result of the lessons that we have learned uh, from the global financial crisis. Uh, on the other end, uh, and you, you were mentioning that the lessons learned during the global financial crisis regarding the need of international cooperation seem all but forgotten. Contrary to what happened in 2008, 2009, the G7 and the G20 have played only a minor role in the policy response. Uh, the pledge is to keep the economies open in order to accelerate the recovery that were prominent in G20 statement 10 years ago have now been substituted by protectionist policies and uh, supply, supply, sh- um, uh, supply chain uh, reshoring. Is the coronavirus crisis putting the final nail in the coffin of global international cooperation? Uh, as you were mentioning, what's going on with the uh, US and China uh, is quite worrying. And uh, if that is the case, also is globalization in jeopardy? Um, I mean, I think COVID obviously accelerates events that we were all familiar with last, well, really since the advent of the Trump presidency. Um, I'm not sure that you could say that, you know, COVID has fundamentally damaged Chinese-European relations. I know there is profound resentment in Europe at the face mask diplomacy of Beijing and the German Marshall Fund uh, surveys of public opinion in Europe, I thought were extremely striking. I don't know whether you saw them, they came out last week, but they showed the European public even more hawkish than the American public on China, uh, even on issues like climate change. But at the leadership level, I don't see the the huge shift. I mean, there was a shift going on, um, but I don't think COVID is driving the shift in the European case. Um, but with regard to the US, I think the, there's no doubt at all that this crisis has brought to a head the extraordinary centrifugal wrecking ball tendencies of the Trump administration. Um, the response to the WHO is extraordinary. Um, their refusal to be part of the joint effort to develop a vaccine is remarkable. The unilateral actions in the middle of the crisis, March 11th, you know, the the banning of movement across the Atlantic without prior consultation or even just, you know, alerting European governments to the fact this was going to happen. Um, it, all of that is is remarkable. And um, yes, so I mean, at that level, it's it's clear it's clear that you're you're absolutely right. And the the inward turn, the necessary inward turn in the U.S. case, driven by the the failure to contain the crisis up to this point will compound that um, and must. Uh, caveats, let me add caveats, because I think broadly speaking, this is difficult to disagree with, but um, at, w- at one crucial level, cooperation has continued in a way that's been vital this time around as it was the last time around, which is at the central bank level. Um, this isn't to say that Lagarde and Powell have liaised on every single move they've made, but, and it's pretty clear that early on in the first Fed move um, in early March, there was no prior, I think, notification of anyone else to the fact that they were bringing forward, I think, on the 3rd or the 4th of March. And the 12th of March, from the point of view of the ECB, spreads on to our business. Lagarde's notorious press conference was also clearly not coordinated with the Americans. But I think really from the following weekend, from the 14th and 15th of March onwards, it's been pretty clear that there's been an agreement by all of the major central banks to put the foot on the gas and to keep the gas pedal down. And if you look at Jerome Powell's you know, telephone diary, it's pretty clear that he's talking to the Europeans and major central bank figures around the world constantly, several times a day to several key people. Um, and with the 
reopening, if you like, of the swap line facility, which the ECB made some use of, though nowhere near on the same scale as in 2008-9. There's also been a practical uh, cooperation. Uh, and the Japanese central bank has made very heavy use of the swap lines this time around. So on that very important American-Asian axis, the cooperation at the central banking level, I think, is very real. So this is a story. This is one of my kind of continuous counterpoints um, in that the, it's, it's clear that the, that the central banking community acts as a kind of last ditch of global cooperation. Um, I think there's even a sense that with the People's Bank of China, the Fed was opening a window with this discount facility, which as far as I know, no one's actually used, but the, the offer, if you like, to enable access to dollars from the Fed by way of discounting treasuries or repairing them essentially was, 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 is, uh, was an innovation. It, it's possible also, I think, that within the security establishment, we're beginning to see a return to a kind of alliance politics. I think people like Pompeo um, this doesn't go for everyone in the Trump administration, but certain figures like that, as they, as it were, ramp up their, their, their rhetoric against China, are actually looking for Cold War-style alliances with willing partners. So you could get countervailing tendencies like that. Um, so that's one caveat, as it were. There is cooperation and there are some reverse salient kind of tendencies towards building new axes of cooperation. I think the other thing I would say, and you know this from you know, the, my book, which you kindly cited in the opening. <laughs> I mean, it's worth saying there are some co forms of cooperation we could do without. Um, and, you know, everyone is fondly remembers the G20 meetings of the spring of 2009 with Barack Obama and Gordon Brown presiding and the heyday of the new Keynesianism and, you know, talk of the new Brad Woods and so on. But I think we also need to acknowledge the role that the G20 played from 2010 onwards, which was really as the outrider, as the forerunner, as the advocate of austerity. And it's at those G20 meetings that the disastrous turn to austerity is agreed with really weird global coalitions with the Germans, the Koreans, the Chinese hammering down on the Obama administration, which are desperately trying to argue the case for a sensible, you know, sustained uh, fiscal stimulus. If you speak to survivors of the Obama administration who were at the G20 meeting in Seoul, they describe it as a nightmare of bullying um, by the rest of the world when what they thought they were, you know, they, they were dealing with intense hostility domestically from the resurgent GOP and then found themselves under fire from, you know, Schäuble and the Chinese um, over America's quote unquote irresponsible fiscal and monetary policy. When we know in retrospect, I think it's clear that the Fed was doing a heroic job um, at that moment uh, with Q2 in yeah, QE2, in uh, sustaining liquidity, amongst others for Europe's banks. So, you know, like cooperation can be, um, you know, a net positive. Um, and obviously, Cold War style hostility is, is hardly what I think certainly personally is not something I would choose as the future, though there may be people on the call who take a very much dimmer view of China and who disregard this as an absolute necessity of the current moment. I think this is a very difficult judgment call, um, but um, uh, but that cooperation can also therefore come at a cost. And I think in a sense, that is the choice that we have to make with regard to China and Europe, frankly, may have to make it with regard to the United States too. Obviously, all of us have our fingers crossed for an outcome to the American election, which restores something like normality in Washington, DC. But if in the eventuality that that doesn't turn out that way, then Europe will presumably have to think about, um, you know, the risks of and the costs and the benefits of not cooperating with the Americans on key issues. Um, Adam, last question before I open to the floor. So pandemics are not new in history and their economic impact and legacy are not clear cut. In fact, uh, the Black Death, which, kill, which killed uh, between one third and half of the European population in the mid 14th century also opened the way to major economic and cultural transformations that in turn laid down the basis uh, uh, of the Renaissance. In many other cases, uh, the impact was not so positive uh, and led to economic decline and political turmoil. 
Um, if you look at the present pandemic, what makes you hope that uh, we may come out of it without too many scars and find the ways to put in place a more inclusive and sustainable economic order, including in terms of climate change? For instance, yesterday on Social Europe, you seem quite a bit on the possibility of making significant progress on decarbonization in Europe, even in the short term. And on the other end, what makes you worry that we will fail and economic and political instability and conflict could become the new normal? Uh, that's a huge <laughs> um, I mean, I'm always, I'm always uh, let me try and you know, pick out a few aspects of it. I'm always a little alarmed when, you know, as a historian, you get asked, well, tell us about why the Black Death was such a great thing for Europe. You know, like you end up sounding like some horrendous, no, Mao, no, it's much worse than Maoism or Stalinism. It's like, you know, the ends justifies the means. It's, I mean, I, I, I find this, you know, the, the, the Black Death was, was the utter destruction of large parts of European society. And, you know, no one in their right mind would, as it were, it, only over the very long run from the, from the vantage point of, you know, several thousand meters up does it does it appear like a kind of net a net positive um none of n none of the recent epidemics um have had the capacity to fundamentally change i mean ultimately that argument tends to rest on a set of assumptions about the labor market and how if you lose that many people it shifts the balance of, you know between different factors of production i mean no one in their right mind would wish such an outcome on any modern or any society, frankly. I mean, it's a catastrophic shock, which has some, you know, 50 to 100 years later may potentially change factor markets in a way which then produces some other outcomes. Mercifully, we haven't come close to experiencing an epidemic like that. Even the worst, you know, the HIV and epidemic in sub-Saharan Africa did not have that impact. Um, it, they were just catastrophes. Um, but they weren't the sort of transformative catastrophe that you're talking about, for better or worse, in large part because of our capacity to counter steer. And even in the worst case recently, which is the pandemic or in, in sub-Saharan Africa, after all, within 50, 15 to 20 years, we began to develop medication, which has allowed millions of people there to live with the disease rather than dying um, and restored something like a more normal demographic balance to those societies that were worst affected. And to my mind, you know, the, the, the thing that we have to wrap our heads around with COVID is that after all, the shock that we started by talking about, the economic shock, is the result of our collective and individual effort to prevent more people dying than is absolutely necessary. And in some sense, the great glory, I think we should celebrate this fact about our current situation is that not more people have died than have died. And heavens knows it was bad enough in Bergamo and in Northern Italy and in New York for certain periods and in Wuhan for a week or two. Um, but that's as bad as it's gotten. And thank God for that. And frankly, we should collectively congratulate ourselves that the price has not been much higher. And we should think seriously about how it is that we reduce that price even further. So you know, this isn't in any way to excuse what what I think in his, in historical retrospect will emerge, you know, in a pretty dark light, um, namely the public health policy failures in Italy, in France, in Spain, in the United Kingdom, and in New York, um, not all of the United States, but in New York and in New Jersey in particular, where you know, a disease which, as the Chinese demonstrated and the South Koreans even more, can be contained and need not claim tens of thousands of lives, claim tens of thousands of lives and inflicted massive economic damage. So, you know, I mean, this is to situate this. This epidemic will not go down in history before its mortality or its impact on demography. It will go down in history because it produced this remarkable collective societal response. And there has never been anything like that before. And that, I presume, is what we will face again and again and as we as we move further into this episode, this period in which nature is, as it were, producing this blowback on us. And that's what we have to brace for collectively and increase our capacity to cope with collectively are the incredibly difficult choices that come with that. It's not obvious to me that our political systems and America is right now a 
extraordinary demonstration, it's not obvious. It's not clear that our political systems are set up to cope with this kind of challenge. Um, does it make me more or less optimistic about other, other, uh, you know, other challenges that we might face? I think, frankly, the jury is, the jury is out on that. Um, I'm not. I'm not a. I'm not a sort of. You know. I'm not gloomy, um, because it seemed to me that we entered 2020 uh, with a growing sense that at least several of the key actors in the global community are serious about the climate problem, and one of them is the EU. Um, and I don't think that we have the big structural answers yet that we need. It's pretty obvious, and the IEA has said this in, in recent weeks, that we don't have the technological fixes that we need to get to net zero by 2050. Um, but there is, there, are, there, are, there is momentum. That momentum has not been lost during the COVID crisis. This has been impressive, I think, about the EU response is that the eye has not come off the ball. It is clear that the green agenda remains live for very good reason. And this is just sensible, but like, it could have gone another way. And there still is, I think, a possibility it may go a different way in China, because it's possible that under the combined impact of COVID and the external pressure, they may double down on coal, which ends the game for all of us if that's what they do. But nevertheless, in Europe, I think we've stayed focused. And as I highlighted in that, piece in Social Europe, which you kindly mentioned. Um, what is really interesting is that market actors appear to believe that the EU is serious about the deal, the Green Deal. And we can tell that because the ETS emissions allowances prices have remained relatively robust, despite the fact that, as we all know, you know, fossil fuel demand has collapsed. So we're actually at a moment in which a mechanism which, since it was introduced in 2005, has been consistently disappointing the European trading, the emissions trading system that the EU invested so much political capital in actually launching, appears to be working and pushing in the right direction. Um, and what I was highlighting in that piece is that tactically, therefore, you know, there is an opportunity to do some real good here. As to reiterate, I don't think we have the big structural fixes. I think we still have to demonstrate that we have the political will to really drive this. We've seen what a total economic collapse produces in terms of emissions gains, and we need to do that, and we need to do that more over a much longer period of time. So we know now how immense this challenge is, but there are some opportunities out there right this very moment to double down And what the markets, what the carbon markets, what the ETS, the emissions markets needs is more signs of seriousness from the political side. Um, and that depends uh, and the market's willingness to believe that the politicians are serious, of course, also depends on the mobilization of civil society. And it depends on the fact that, as all of us remember, there was an extraordinary sense across Europe from 2018 onwards that something had shifted in the political mood. And I'm not one for, you know, zeitgeist and that kind of thing. But I think you'd be naive to imagine that that wasn't the case. Um, and the market sense that. And so understanding the politics of this, they actually believe that politicians who aren't serious about this will be punished, will not be, will be punished. And so I think there's also here an opportunity for European citizens to continue demonstrating their commitment to this agenda, which is one of the ways, as it were, that the politicians are then credibly held to account. And that in turn then is reflected in market outcomes. In other words, this is a virtuous circle of mutual commitment. Um, and we don't get those all the time. And the Eurozone and Europe is only too familiar with vicious circles of decommitment. But periodically, you do get a virtuous circle. And we're actually got one of those right now. And so it's crucial, as it were, to seize those, because that's what history is made out of. Right? History is made out of moments like this, which are spun either one way or the other. And we know that from the economics, you know, whatever it takes, 2012, you can shift the course of history through words, through language, through commitments of various types, but if you do not make those commitments at crucial moments, it can also go in a different direction. And that's what I was trying to highlight. And it does seem to me that there's a, there's, a, there's a virtuous circle possibility. Is it the whole fix? No. Do we need more? Obviously. But And is, do I believe that markets are generally speaking the best solution to this? I think that's a dogma. Sometimes they may be, sometimes they are. But when, but when the market is giving you what you actually want, double down on it. Make it work. Reward the people. And we don't do this enough, right? We, we didn't reward. We spend too much time in critical European discourse talking about hedge funds and so on who speculated against the euro. Right? 
A lot of people didn't, including people like George Soros, bet on the euro in 2011. And some of them paid the price for doing that. Um, and, and what we need to do in this case, actually, is reward the speculators gambling on the seriousness of the Green Deal. Great. Uh, so a lot of food for thought. Um, colleagues, if you want to ask a question, uh, send uh, uh, through the chat uh, to indicate it so that uh, uh, I give you the floor. Any volunteer? Otherwise, I have other questions. <laughs> Moreno, I've got a, I've got a question. Yeah. Thanks, Adam. Thanks very much for uh, for this discussion. I think it's been been uh, very interesting so far. I wanted to come back to the issue of legacy debts that you were talking about earlier, both yeah. in the con in the European context and talking about Italy and 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 other sovereigns that have a unsustainably high or, or worryingly high debt load, but also just in the United States and other in other countries where given that it seems like there's going to be very severe restrictions on economic activity until we have some sort of vaccine or cure to the virus, and there's going to be problems with bankruptcies and businesses going under, and especially in the United States, probably the loss of income for lots of people. What should policymakers do about the, the, the debts that we have, both in the public and the private sector, how would you think about that in, in the context of stagnation that we had going into this? Um, and also because when you think about the traditional tools, higher taxes, uh, inflation, if central banks are even able to generate higher inflation or some sort of restructuring, they all have drawbacks. So how do you think about what the right policy response should be? A great. I mean, this is a great question. Um, I don't think anyone has anything more than provisional answers. Um, I would, from my point of view, it seems clear that um, the worst way to go would be the way that we went in, after 2008. In other words, to a rapid snapback starting as soon as 2010 um, towards you know, debt consolidation as the top priority. Um, given the scale of this shock, given the asymmetric quality of the shock in the end, um, especially for Europe, to go head back down that road, um, I think will be, will be exactly the deflationary, recessionary shock that Europe doesn't need. Um, my hope, frankly, and it's a kind of desperate hope, is that once you are in Italy's situation as of next year, in fact, realistic conversations of that type cease because it's just not plausible to expect Italy to run even larger primary surpluses than it already does to get you down from 150% plus of GDP back to safety, which would allow, let's say it's 120%. The agonizing condition that Italy has been in in recent years is that 130, 135% of GDP, rational technocrats can sit down and say to themselves, well, if we do the math and we stretch this over 15 years, there's a glide path which takes them back to 125 to 120. Once you get to 150 plus, it seems to me that no one can seriously entertain that conversation. Now, I say that with a degree of caution because, of course, we did entertain those kind of conversations with regard to Greece. And if you know, as well as I do, that the ESM projections for the Greek package go out to 2060 and things like that. I hope that with regard to a country as significant in European politics as Italy is, we're not going to indulge in that kind of eyewash because that's what it is. Um, so what does that mean? <laughs> I don't frankly know, and I think we're trying to avoid the question as hard as we possibly can because we know it's a huge political dead end. And I think we all know what the fudge is that's going to likely emerge, which is a protracted, indefinite role for the ECB as the warehouse for that debt, which is where it's safely kept, where it would be if Italy was Japan, um, which after all manages debt, which is going to head up over to, I think it's going to be to 20% of GDP, isn't it? By 
by this time next year. So the Egypt, you know, and this isn't a problem in the Japanese case. Um, and the ECB is also, of course, um, the agency which is crucially responsible for ensuring that yields don't pop. Um, and as long, as long as we can fudge the issue of the difference between, as it were, legitimate, real differences that require Italian spreads to be large and a more general commitment to keeping yields down, we can make this issue, we can keep this issue on the back burner. Um, it's clear to me what the only you know, viable solution is, is to permanently agree to do this, to permanently keep it there for the ECB to then permanently commit to act like all other large central banks are acting right now, which is permanently commit to you know, basically yield targeting and to keep those yields low. And on that basis, the problem goes away. But of course, it's very difficult to articulate that politics with explicitly in Europe. But de facto, that seems to me to be where we're heading. And I think that that number, that, that you know, really indigestible number of 150% plus of Italian GDP and public debt is just going to force everyone's hands. Um, they're not going to explicitly provide a solution to the legacy debt issue, but they are going to implicitly abandon efforts to address it by conventional means. Um, and as long as that works, it works, but it's not, you know, that's not, that's, it's not a stable solution. And as Blanchard and Pisani Ferry spelled out in that really excellent short piece they did for our box EU at the beginning of this crisis, and this is a two, you know, there are two equilibria here. There's one equilibrium in which this is completely unsustainable and a runaway crisis. And there's another one in which the spreads are kept down and it's manageable. And all that really matters is whether the Italians continue to have the budgetary discipline, which they've shown consistently since the mid-90s, and generate the you know revenue flow necessary to service the debt, which of course they'll do, and something close to a primary surplus or something even better, you know, stronger than that, so that the debt doesn't explode. Is this a recipe for like you know rapid growth in Italy? No, unfortunately, which is you know where one I guess hopes that the stimulus at the collective level works, and where you might see various types of reform and changes in Italy in the wake of this shock that could push in, you know, a more optimistic direction. This is my crisis avoidance scenario, and it's a series of makeshifts. Um, but with, as it were, Japan as the, or frankly, the US or Great Britain as the kind of lodestar. Because one of the things that has shifted in the course of this crisis, as your question suggested, is that, you know, Italy has moved from being kind of stranded a stranded outlier of our advanced economy debt excess to being not that far away from several other big countries. Um, and I think that is also going to change the conversation. Um, but I'm a functional finance person at heart, so I don't really see that this is a, this doesn't need to be a catastrophic problem, but it does pose a variety of serious technical issues and it does pose a variety of questions about redistributive politics because what you're basically committed to doing is shuffling quite a lot of GDP through the public account in the form of debt service. Um, and then, of course, it all depends on who's holding the debt, what the interest rates are, as to whether that's something you really, really worry about. Um, one of my other Social Europe columns this spring was to suggest that we need a much more explicit, if you like, anatomy of who owes what to whom. Um, as a way of, as it were, rethinking the politics of this situation, because in this high debt world, that's actually kind of a non-trivial question, unless yields are effectively zero um, or interest rates are effectively zero. <clears throat> thanks, thanks. If I, could, if I could maybe follow up very quickly on that, um, your response made me think about the experience of a lot of emerging markets in, in mm -hmm. this crisis so far and, and leaving aside some of the public health challenges that the, the health sectors in these countries face. Several, several emerging markets have been able to engage in QE. And it seems yeah. like they're, you know, partly this is that they're not really emerging, emerging markets anymore. They're, they're yeah. looking very much like developed countries. But given that many emerging markets don't have the hard currency of the dollar or even the euro to fall back on, I'm wondering what you think is the necessary institutional capacity and toolkit for call the middle income countries in order to be able to get through the next few years. What do you want to see if, you know, when we're looking back in retrospect and judging the Indonesias and South Koreas and so on of the world and who did well, what are we going to look back on and identify as the key tools and institutions that they needed to get through this? <laughs> 
I, I think that's, that has been one of the most impressive developments. I mean, in in Crashed, I like I did a survey of like the fiscal policy responses to eight oh nine. You could already see this happening there, with like the Thailands of this world were mounting very considerable fiscal responses in oh eight oh nine. Um, exactly as you say, what we see now is that they've appropriated the QE toolkit as well, which is which is really like you say, kind of you end up in a sort of circularity, like you know. It, 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 what what made you in an emerging market was that you couldn't do that. Um, and now all of a sudden it turns out that you can do that. So maybe you're not an emerging market at all, which then begs the question of what makes them emerging markets, um, which is where, the, which, which is, I think, the nub of your question, really. Um, well, I think that, you know, one thing we have to say is that they've just, you know, there is a cultural dimension to this. There is a sociological dimension to this. People have gotten used to the idea that the Indonesian central bank is a highly sophisticated player. Um, you know, they have a Maastricht criteria orientated fiscal policy. Uh, they adopted Maastricht criteria as, you know, their way of managing fiscal policy. They did that and they sustained that credibly for 17 years. So that buys you a degree of, of flex in when the going gets rough in 2020. Um, they're big economies with where you you're, it's difficult to imagine global interest in investment in Indonesia and the markets there just simply disappearing, right? There is a the idea of capital as being radically footloose, so it can simply abandon places in the world if they don't conform absolutely to some hard standard. That's a fantasy, I think, at some point. Once you're in that group of the G20, G30, business will come back, and that gives local actors a degree of flexibility. They increasingly, as you know, borrow in their own currencies. They don't borrow in foreign currency. Everyone knows that's high risk. The actors in those economies which do tend to borrow in hard currency are the SOEs, the state-owned enterprises, which are quite often engaged in global enterprise, so they actually have dollar revenue streams. But nevertheless, I think that's one of the vulnerabilities that we're going to be looking at, how they handle those kind of crises. I don't generally buy this kind of logic from a macroeconomic perspective, but from the point of view of managing the politics of global financial markets, I think it's pretty clear that they probably need to map paths back to you know, orthodoxy, if you like. South Africa is having this argument right now. Okay, fine, we need to blow out the budget constraints now. But if you like, if we want to reestablish credibility, we probably need to map a path back to something like um, you know, conventional budgetary rules. We know the Eurogroup is having this conversation right here, right now, in the last 24 hours, if Mario Centeno's intervention and the Financial Times is anything to be gauged by. Like, it's, it's pretty clear that we're all having this conversation. I think for the large advanced economies, it's really an unnecessary conversation to be having. But for the emerging markets, it may tactically be crucial. But I think in the end, we can't underestimate the global context, right? People are looking in this world for they're chasing yield. So this is not a world in which if you're in Indonesia or you're, you know, let alone a South Korea, which clearly is the most obvious case of now bona fide advanced economy, wrong box. Like people are going to want to lend to you. So, you know, the, the world that the world in which we, as it were, imagine those kind of borrowers as eternally at the mercy of ruthless speculative forces that would withdraw funding at the drop of a hat. If that was ever true, it, it ceased to be true sometime in the late, in the, in the, in the, in the 2010s. Um, they're still, of course, subject to the pressures. We know how severe the shakeout was after, after say, in the taper tantrum of 2013. But money comes back to these places. So I think that has shifted the parameters and we are seeing the graduation from, but it's, an, it's, an, it's a, I would, I would want to emphasize for everyone engaged in this game, right? Everyone is still asking the question. And even people in the America will ask the question, where are the bond vigilantes? Surely somebody is going to punish somebody somewhere soon for this kind of behavior, right? We used to think we understood how this game is played. Where are they? Um, and, and it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a truly weird world that we're in and one that's getting progressively stranger as the balance sheets of the big central banks build up, right? For, for longer uh, dated US Treasury debt, the Fed is now beginning to look like the Bank of Japan. I mean, it owns 30, I think, percent or even more, perhaps more of that of 10 year plus uh, in, the, in, in the United States. So 
this is creating a you know a kind of radically politicized global bond market which is very very unlike the world of you know when even the clinton administration was being harassed by the bond market so the normal economy is not coming back it's just a big part of that right the forces that you would normally have expected to restore order just don't look like they have that. Somebody pointed, don't have that force. Somebody pointed out that the expansion of the Fed's balance sheet since March is as large as the total funds under management of PIMCO. Or maybe it was even BlackRock. I think it might actually be even BlackRock. <laughs> so if you've got actors that big on the public side, you know, we are now really in a kind of mixed economy world. Colleague, uh, other questions? Don't hesitate to chip in. Chris? Well, if nobody else yes, I will take the opportunity. Hi, Adam. Thank you very much. It was a very interesting conversation. Uh, I, I just would like maybe to uh, start with my question a bit where you left, uh, uh, because, I mean, QE is part of the story, and, and another one is sort of the um, uh, the retrenchment if you want of global supply chains uh, what what does this mean for global finance uh, would be my my question i mean is is finance i mean to the extent that qe generalized also to sort of uh, emerging economy um is a form of nationalization if you want also of, of finance does this uh, reduce the scope for the, the kind of international um movements in capital that we've seen before uh and so how or not, uh, and and what would how would sort of those uh, international financial capitals be affected by sort of sort of this more, uh, if this was to be a, a trend for the future? That's a great question. I mean, I think maybe it might, maybe we can break it down historically. I mean, if you think about what the great waves of financial globalization have been, you know the 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 the, the dramatic phase in the build up to two thousand and eight centered on the North Atlantic, basically involved the merger of the mega banks in Europe into the American financial system. And we saw that come apart in 08. And we know what has happened since. So the European banks have suffered a historic defeat, if you like, in their project of becoming global players in investment banking. Paribas has now announced that it wants to be you know, Europe's champion, but we should take that with a pinch of salt, I think. Um, but that was one wave um, of financial globalization. And of course, there were other flows. If you look at the BIS data, it's clear that a lot of Asian surpluses were being channeled by way of Europe. But if you like, the main action was on the North Atlantic still, all the way up to 2008. What we've seen, if we break down, as it were, the next phase since 2008 has been an emerging market-centered story, which includes, as uh, Ben and I were just discussing, a whole bunch of countries which, you know, for which that is a really euphemistic and unhelpful kind of label. I mean, crucially, a bunch of countries which have clearly advanced economies in other space. And on the other hand, it's just a story about China. Um, an emerging market is a category that's kind of burying that. Um, and it's difficult for me to see, given how well, surprisingly, the big emerging markets have dealt with the crisis so far, given how, and this is early days, we could still see dramatic fallout six to 12 months from now if the global trading system doesn't recover at all, there are going to be big losers. It's quite possible that we could see some major casualties in the fossil fuel sector. You know, it's not, not obvious how all of the, the high cost oil producers are going to get through this. But like so far, we haven't seen anything in the emerging market world, which would, as it were, suggest the imminence of a breakdown in that Model. Quite what its future is, I think, is an open question, but it's one of the success stories of this, of this drama so far. Um, and in fact, many of the leading emerging markets have been able to borrow dramatically at slightly higher yields than they would have paid before the crisis. But they've, you know, they built the piggy bank because this was actually a moment in which they could borrow. And clearly the Fed and other central banks around the world were trying to build that. So. I think all of the question marks for me are really about um, China and how it fits in this story. Um, because up to this moment, you would say it unambiguously is part of the story of global financialization. Um, 
both in the sense of the growth of China's own banks, um, but also of the role of Western banks in intermediating Chinese finance by way of Hong Kong, crucially. Um, and that involves um, all the obvious American big banks um, and crucially HSBC and Standard, who are like the Anglo Hong Kong players. And I think it's obvious, you know, how fragile that situation is at this moment. And I think there are two really weird countervailing forces. On the one hand, um, the situation of the Hong Kong-based Huan Renminbi dollar interface is precarious like it hasn't ever been before. And banks like HSBC and Standard were basically take, required to take a loyalty oath to Beijing, right, and being asked to sign up to the security law which then immediately produced ructions with their Hong Kong staff, but they simply couldn't do anything else because they need the mainland business and they have huge mainland staffs as well anyway. So they're there. No, this is very high stakes. And Hong Kong is the number three global dollar hub. So this is, this is very precarious, I think. But on the other hand, Beijing has persisted with its efforts to lure large Western players and above all American players into China's domestic financial markets. And foreign ownership of Chinese bonds has risen to levels we've never seen before. If you were looking for a hedge, if you were looking for some extra yield on some sovereign bonds right now, you'd buy Chinese ones. Um, and we know that they have liberalized, you know, they're in the process of liberalizing the joint venture sector there so that JP Morgan and all the other big American players have actually bought out, bought out their joint venture partners. We know that the big American fund managers are desperate to get into the Chinese market and the Chinese are signaling that they're going to make that possible. Um, there's a strange kind of countervailing force here. And I imagine it's entirely deliberate on Beijing's part that, you know, once upon a time we thought of, um, the People's Bank of China and the, in, you know, the internationalizers of Chinese finance as being a kind of reformist wing of the Beijing regime that was using the carrots of financial integration as a way of leveraging, a bit like a, a vincolo externo, you know, a kind of Italian type strategy, use the requirements of SDR membership and so on to drive the agenda of financial reform within China. I don't think that's a plausible story anymore. But what I do think is quite a plausible story is that the People's Bank of China and the big regulators are, as it were, involved in a, in a power play. And they're basically saying to major global financial players, this is too big a market for you to resist. Um, and they're trying to build, as we know, a, an investment banking champion within China that can compete because one of the risks is that you open this market up and it'll be totally dominated by the Americans and the brokers, um, you know, issuing houses in China are all small fry compared to their absolutely massive commercial banks. So they need to build an investment banking champion and they're doing that. You know, they've removed their restrictions for two of the big commercial banks on doing investment banking activity. So I think you can see the Chinese are this extremely strategic player um, looking, for, looking for leverage. Um, and I think that's the future, right? Not a sort of autarkic, complete breakdown retreat, but a, a genuinely strategic um, use of globalization. And what I find really interesting is that um, and I've, I've never, I mean, I, I really think this is one of the underrated moments in recent history is the BIS annual report of last year. So this is a rather nerdy kind of idea, but, but they outlined the new roadmap for, for EM engagement with global, with financial globalization. Um, and they were saying basically that theory is lagging behind practice. And what does practice, what this is also goes to Ben's question, right? What is best practice if you're a deeply financially integrated EM? Well, um, what you need to do is highly proactive macroprudential regulation of all of your key exposed private actors so that you don't end up in doom loops. You need to build a large strategic foreign exchange reserve. You need to, that enables you to not stop, but break rapid movements in the exchange rate, which can become destabilizing and accelerate capital movement. And you need to be willing, if necessary, and this is the BIS saying this, to be willing to engage in various types of capital control, if necessary. 
And both the BIS and the IMF have signed off on this formula. And whose formula is this? This is China's formula, right? And this is China's formula, I think, for engagement with the world of global financial globalization. Um, you know, an uninhibited, no holds barred macro prudential, which is basically just the willingness to actually do political economy. In other words, find weak actors in the private sector and bully them into doing whatever it is that you think is necessary for you at that moment, including political intimidation. Um, so this is more like a Russian model, if you like, or a Chinese model than a kind of EU type approach. Um, and, but then do all the macro stuff right too, right? So it's not just a kind of crude oligarchic power play, but it's actually also get your fundamentals right, um, manage your macro, macro positions uh, in a way that's astute and be uninhibitedly pragmatic when it comes to actually managing the balance of payments. Um, and this is, I think, the bicycle. It's hugely precarious. It doesn't promise. It's, no, it's, not a, no, it's not an order. It's not a constitutional kind of settlement in the mode that the Europeans are always looking for under the influence, I think, of German ordo liberalism. We're, like, we're looking for like, you know, the structure that will make everything sound forever after. You know, a competitive social market economy that will deliver X, Y, Z. That isn't this. This isn't. It's, this is much more tactical kind of thinking. Um, it's there's no autopilot. You have to be on this all the time, and you have to be willing to engage in quite a muscular defense of national interest with regard to global players. And the Chinese have done this with real, with you know, with with raw material um, suppliers. You, the major global raw material suppliers have paid the price right for messing with the chinese over pricing issues they will arrest your executives they will put people up on charges you do not mess around with them um but you can also do you know it's also very profitable and you can actually engage in this market and that is i think the mode in which globalization goes forward um so it's not de it's not uncoupling but it definitely is a renegotiation of the rules of the game and i think people like hsbc and and standard are really feeling this right now but i think all of the you know savvy american players the steve schwartzmans of this world and so on who've been playing the china game for some time know that this is the way this is played it's hugely political and it's a non-stop negotiation it never stops you never settle down. You don't ever have complete confidence. And then, of course, the European in us says, oh, well, in that case, you can't possibly make profit. Max Weber, Max Weber, you know, you need rationality. Capitalism needs predictability. It's not true. That's, that's not how you do business in emerging markets like this. You constantly have to negotiate. And you take what you can get while you can get it. And you double down and you build relationships. And that's what Apple has done, you know, and it's hugely complicated. You need to play politics all the time. That's what Foxconn and these kind of people are doing between China and America. You know, you promise to build the Americans a chip plant. You ever deliver? Well, we'll, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, what can we get? <laughs> like, will it be worth our while? Uh, how serious are they? I mean, so I think it's that kind of a world. Um, and and um, so it's, it's, it's a much higher level of radical uncertainty. Uh, then I take the prerogative as uh, moderator to ask the last question um, and goes back to your book uh, Crashed uh, in the last chapter that is called uh, The Shape of Things to Come you wrote uh, since 2007 the scale of the financial crisis has placed uh, that relationship between democratic politics and the demands of capitalist governance under immense strain the coronavirus pandemics has added to the strain, although it might not be fully evident uh, yet. Moving forward, what can be done to relax uh, this strain and uh, um, to find a new compromise? I mean, we're seeing such an incredible kind of rogues gallery of options here, right? Because on the one hand, you have examples like South Korea, where you keep the bus on the road, the, the pandemic never gets out of hand, the economic cost is real but limited, you could have an election in the middle of this crisis, you know, a progressive or at least centre-left government wins, like all the plate, you know, you don't drop any of the plates and the game goes on. Um, I think in Europe we've seen a much harder test. And Europe has, I think, remarkably come through it in the sense that the, the epidemic got out of hand. The economic costs are going to be enormous 
but there has been a very substantially creative political response. We have lifted rules, we're changing rules, we're negotiating. Is it easy? No, but at least we're in the game in the European case, right? The, there is a grasping of the real problem. There is a willingness to negotiate about it. It's a demonstration of democracy under huge stress after serious governmental failure. And Europe, I mean, occasionally you hear these complacent conversations with European colleagues you know, comparing themselves to China. We, we, we failed by comparison with the Chinese regime in handling this pandemic drastically. Tens of thousands of Europeans have died that would not have died if we'd handled it as well as the Chinese handled this crisis. We had all of February. And those people died. And if we had handled the crisis as well as the South Koreans, tens of thousands of Europeans would still be alive. It's a disaster, but our political systems are nevertheless coping. At the other end of the spectrum, we have the United States. I'm not even going to talk about Brazil, but like the United States for me is the true train wreck because we have seen everything spelled out, right? We have seen a failure of governance, just like in Europe. We then saw an effort to shut down, just like in Europe. Then we saw an inability to sustain the shutdown, uh, an explicit argumentation that the economy required us to lift the shutdown, a resulting breakdown in, in public health, which, is, which we're now in right now. And it appears that the decision by the Trump administration, if you read the Politico reports, Washington Post and so on, is that they've just decided to ignore the crisis. That, that a strategy of the Trump administration is basically just is, is what they call numbness. So what they're literally, the word numb is used. So what you're hoping for is that people stop caring about a crisis which is going to claim the lives probably in the US now of you know perhaps 150,000 people, which is as many people as died in the United States in World War I. Like, it's, it's mind blowing. So we really are going to see like the entire spectrum and you know, can we describe that as coping on the American part? Well, of course, in a certain sort of way it is. But I mean, it's clearly a hugely delegitimating crisis. And it's not even as though you can simply say in the American case that to talk in terms of the necessity of restarting the economy is just merely callous. Because the social crisis in this country is, is utterly profound, right? The, the shock to the American social fabric because of the, the nature of America's labor market institutions is, is, is staggering. Um, there are tens of millions of people who've lost their jobs and are now struggling to find their jobs. They've lost their health insurance. The unemployment benefit system, you know, is going to basically, unless Congress decides otherwise, is going to collapse at the end of July. Um, We've had armed showdowns between groups of Americans, not just over Black Lives Matter, but over the question of reopening the economy. I mean, it's as profound a derailment of governance as you could possibly ask for. And only, you know, only a country as given to self-satisfaction and, you know, Panglossian thinking, I mean, only America could possibly digest this. I mean, if this had happened in Germany, imagine the angst you know, they, they would never recover from the, the from the humiliation that America's gone through. It's possible that America's narcissism can somehow enable them to ride this out. But but it, in every other respect, it's just a it's a staggering demonstration of the in, of the inability to cope with this kind of crisis. And we we had an inkling that climate change might be this kind of problem for America. After all, there was every reason to think that it was. And COVID has just you know, has demonstrated it in a truly, and this to me is the really deep question for the Europeans is, is this kind of a polity a partner for Europe? I mean, New York and Italy and France and Britain and so on, we all screwed up together, but the response politically has been so different. Uh, how, how going forward does one imagine cooperation? I mean, we are in a situation right now where the EU is admitting travelers from China and not admitting travelers from the United States. And it's not clear what the timeline is on which that changes. And we, and we know that that is the axis around which climate politics in Europe has revolved over recent years. We know what the expectations were for the Leipzig summit this fall. We, we know where we were headed with regard to Glasgow. Now, to me, this is the really disturbing thing about the COVID crisis is that it reinforces that, I think, extremely puzzling and disorientating conclusion is that China is, 
potentially a partner for the EU in handling the Anthropocene, and it's not obvious that the United States is. And, and I don't know what, I really think we're only at the beginning of trying to figure out what that means, but I think that's been, it sh it's kind of been obvious since the Kyoto moment in the late 90s, but we've done a good job of denying this reality. And whenever we have a democratic administration in the US, of course, hopes rise and, and the picture shifts dramatically, and it's possible the Biden administration could do that again. But, but I think this is the structural question, um, is, is how, you know, who are our, who are our partners? Because, because the condition for the success of democratic governance of these kind of problems, you know, it's not just local, it also does depend on the international environment. And we could be facing a deeply invidious choice. And we have been there before. This isn't unprecedented. These are the choices that decision makers faced in Europe in the 1970s in dealing with the risk, what we thought then of the risk of, you know, the nuclear annihilation of humanity. And we know that many people at that point argued for various types of detente, co peaceful coexistence. And we know those choices were invidious because they involved the recognition of abuse, you know, regimes which were flagrant abusers of human rights. We know that you had to persist with this in the face of essentially martial law. Those, I think, are some of the choices that we may be that we may be heading towards. Um, in future, and it's a it's a it's a profoundly disconcerting um, vista. Adam, thanks a lot. It was a um, great conversation, uh, and I mean, your contribution uh, was uh, really excellent, and uh, we enjoyed that. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, I think that we went through a lot of uh, ground uh, and uh, uh, we learned a lot, at least I learned a lot. So thanks for having accepted uh, to uh, speak to our group uh, and uh, we'll be in touch. Hopefully we'll be able to meet in person in not too distant future, all depends on the vaccine. Very uh, much hope. Yes. Yes. One of the great things running the European Institute is to get to know you folks better and to appreciate the work you do. So. Um, yeah, I look forward. I look forward. One way or the other, we will we will meet again relatively soon. Yes, I mean, 